Yesterday, University of Western Ontario vanquished the reigning champs UCI in what many expected to be a one-sided affair. Now they're just three wins away from earning themselves the title of champion. Bad news, they have to get through another tournament favorite in Maryville. Hello everyone, I'm Gabriella LaTigris Devia Allen joined by Clutch Academy's coach Artemis and Mark Zimmerman. How you doing today, fellas? Hello. Hey, I'm fantastic. <laughs> it's a cold, rainy day in LA, so there's no place I'd rather be than watching League of Legends. It's Championship Sunday. Yeah. There's so much on the line for all of the college competitors that we have been watching for days. And today, we have so much more to look forward to. So let's take a look at the roads each team took to challenge one another today. After winning the Northern Conference and earning the number one seed, Maryville took down NC State in the quarterfinals and then proceeded to taste revenge by knocking out Illinois. And oh my goodness, Oof. you know that Illinois was looking forward to that match all the way through, but couldn't quite come through in the end. Yeah, I think uh, it was a good, sweet revenge for Maryville, but it was a different series I think a lot of people were expecting with how slow uh, the games were overall. It's a very controlled approach out of Maryville compared to their quarterfinals where you know they were going back and forth, they were losing gold leads, it was much more explosive. Exactly, I think we saw a bit of a nervy performance in the first set from Maryville, and then after that, they really seemed to settle down and come into their own with this slow, controlled style of macro that Mark's talking about. And as long as they play that game today, I think they'll do well. And they had a lot of aggression come out of some of their players, really showing what they have as far as potential goes to take on their competition here today. But earlier, Avali caught up with Niall's biggest fan to get her thoughts ahead of today's series. Thanks, guys. I'm here with Melanie, who is actually the mother of top laner for Maryville, Niles. Uh, how are you enjoying the tournament so far? Great, Avalie. It's been an amazing experience. The boys on Maryville and actually the entire teams have been um, just hardworking, um, good young men. I've had an opportunity to speak to quite a few of them um, outside of play and at the hotel, and it's just um, gives me hope for humanity to see um, collegiate students just um, respectful and, and nice to one another. And of course, th there are a few spicy tidbits that they throw at one another to, to uh, mix things up. But it's just been a wonderful experience here. It's been Riot Games has put on a, a great um, venue. And speaking of spicy tidbits, I understand that you purchased the entire team a uh, good luck charm. Can you tell me about that? I did purchase them an entire good luck charm. Um, so the entire team, I, I wish I could have gotten the alternate also, but uh, as I was out shopping one of the days the boys weren't playing, I came upon some socks with Smurfs on them. And so um, Smurfing is a term used, I guess, originally uh, meaning to create a, an account and play a sub-level team so you can really trounce on them. Um, and now it's kind of evolved to just pounding the heck out of the other team. So I uh, got them all um, Smurf socks for good luck and kind of as a, you know, just a uh, element to bring them closer together and cohesiveness. You are a very educated mother in the esports scene and uh, lingo, but anything that you want to say to the boys before they go into their game? Um, just best of luck. Um, praying for y'all and the opposing team. They all have um, worked, worked their hearts out, played their hearts out, and I'm um, just so very proud of all of them. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Back to you guys. That's such a cool mom. The LCS yeah. teams don't even have coordinated socks that are supposed to be like BMing their opponents. Right. Why Maryville has that? Well, that's the real question. Are the Smurf socks what it takes to secure the victory here today? I mean, it's, it's definitely an advantage, right? I'm not sure if it's going to push them over the edge, but it can only help. There's something about being comfortable, you know, feeling in your own shoes. Yeah, you like want to see them like put their shoes up, take Ooh. them, show them off to the opponent that like they're all coordinated, that this is going to be easy. They don't need their main accounts or whatever. <laughs> no more coach needed, even though they have, what, three, maybe 50 coaches yeah. on their side? Five, yeah. six, three, <laughs> something like that. They can bench them all. It's all about the Smurf socks now. But they do have their shot to reclaim their title versus an unlikely finalist in Western who took down the reigning champs in their first series to go a full five games in the history of the collegiate championship the first time. Yeah, and this is one of my favorite collegiate series of all time. The way that they came back against the tournament favorites in UCI off the back of Gorica and Julius in the jungle, and also short hop and Blaze Nova in the bot lane. This was really a team performance. Slasher 2, his Oriana was crazy at times. So for me, this was one of the most feel-good moments of the whole tournament. I was really rooting for these guys to pull off the comeback, and they did. Hey, you can see how much it means to them. And like you said, every member had to step up. Anytime mm -hmm. you have a close five-game series like that, everyone's going to have those kind of standout moments. But I think more than anyone else, 
Gorica was the guy that a lot of people were looking at in that series, all his crazy picks, and that's what a lot of people are excited about for this matchup overall. Well, and there's something to be said also about that momentum follows through when we run into some of the players earlier this morning, and you can still feel that excitement radiating from them. So how do you think that is going to influence Western going against the confidence of Maryville? Well, the underdog mentality is a powerful thing. We saw that in Western Ontario last night against UCI, and Maryville in this matchup is almost certainly favored. I think everybody looking at this almost expects Maryville to win. So again, you know, that's exactly where Western Ontario want to be. That's their bread and butter. They've been here before. Just channel that underdog energy and you'll do fine. Will it be enough? I think so. I mean, it's been all tournament long. I've been hearing the top three teams are UCI, Maryville, and Columbia. And so they don't really have to change their mindset heading to the exactly. finals. It's the same kind of underdog bulletin board material that you've been reading this entire time. And as you are both very familiar, after Western's upset yesterday, the desk had one thing on their lips when it came to today's series. And it was top lane, top lane, top lane. As Niles and Gorica square off, you both just mentioned them here today already. Yep. Baby Hooney, let's go. I'm so excited to see what the picks he can pull off today. And it's not like he's this Kled one trick that he was hyped up to be. He's playing the meta champs like Akali and Aatrox as well, in addition to his vain pocket picks. So this is somebody I've been keeping an eye on for a while, and hopefully we can find a good matchup in the top lane where both players can show off their skill. It's really interesting because Niles has been playing a lot more of these standard meta flex picks that we've been seeing since MSI, and it's Gorica who's pulling out all the crazy stuff. So it sets up a really interesting top lane battle about whose play style is gonna get broken by the other guy First. Sure, and they both have their signature champions with Niles on his Jace and his game plank and Gorica on his Kled. So I'm looking to other members of the team to step up and start pulling some target bans to hopefully free these champions up. So if Clyde can start drawing a Thresh ban or if Slasher can start drawing an Orianna ban, these are ways that we can see them on these comfortable chips champions, so I'm looking for that today. So many of these series did come down to the solo lanes, whether it be top or mid, and then as you both just mentioned, there were some very comfortable with the flex picks, others are going for more of that comfort pick. So Mark, do you think it is a case where you have one team that is utilizing some more of those meta flexes versus someone else coming out with something unconventional? Yeah, I think that's something that definitely helped Western in that final game, that Kled with the Ignite was something that no one was really prepared for. I mean, we know he plays it, but to break it out in that final game is very surprising, so I hope to see that they have some some extra stuff up their sleeves for this game. They didn't leave it all out in the semifinals. Well, in the end, this matchup is also a fitting reminder of the progress of the collegiate scene. Maryville were the first scholarship school to win and the title, and they aim to take it back from another band of Canadian competitors who have made an unexpected run in the finals. But it really has just grown so much from the first collegiate to now. Yeah, it's one of those things where like the more it ch uh, changes, the more it stays the same. Like, right. yes, the scene has grown. There's 354 schools that competed this year, 108 more than last year. But it always feels like it comes down to Canada versus a you know collegiate program. Yeah, exactly. It's sort of this series where you have this big powerhouse with all these scholarships and then you know these eight guys from Canada coming together to try and dethrone the defending champions from 2017. So it's a nice storyline and there's a lot of hype and I can't wait for the games to start. Yeah, I mean, that's the impressive part that there's 80 more collegiate programs right. this year and you still have Western Ontario fighting their way up there to actually still be in contention despite not having that same backing. So much to be proud of from all of the teams in attendance. But with the match just moments away, let's send it to the stage for the player introductions. Months of competition culminate to the finals today as Maryville and Weston clash for the title of college champion. First up, starting on the blue side for game one, it's the University of Western Ontario. In top, it's a freshman, it's Gorica. In jungle, a junior, Julius. And another junior there, their mid laner, it's Slasher. One, one, four, four! In his third year, that superstar bot laner, Short Hop. And his junior lane partner, support, Blaze Nova. Let's take a look at their opponents. On the red side, it's Maryville University. Top lane, we've got a freshman, Niles. In the jungle, it's the senior CKG. In the mid lane, sophomore Wolfie. In the bot, another senior Saskio. And his freshman support, it's Clyde. 
Once more, here are your finalists for the 2019 College Championship. Western is definitely a dark horse that no one has really recognized. Yes! 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 Let's go, lads. I definitely see them winning the series against UCI. Western Ontario heads to the finals to take on Maryville University. Western plays with a lot of kind of raw power. No one really expected them to be as good, and they are a really good team. We became friends with Western Ontario because we were sitting at the same table and we were just talking to them, and they seemed like really cool guys. It's a brotherhood, you know, we all we all have mad love and respect for each other. A lot of that friendship and trust has been through working together over a few years. We love the game and we love each other and it's been incredible for our education as well. It's good to meet them here and they're even cooler in person and they're really great guys. Gorka, again, going forward, and would you believe it? It's a three for nothing. I knew Niles from, like, a mutual friend. Gorka hit me up for top lane tips. I asked if he could coach me. He's just kind of like, you know, my master. Here we are in the collegiate finals. Massive outplay! We want to be the team that people look to, and if you get offered a miracle, you're like, oh my gosh. Like, I want to go there and I want to win titles. Winning this year would definitely put us up there as one of those schools. So it's, it's extremely important for me to solidify Maryville as a top esports team. Honestly, never thought I'd be here. We are a completely student-run organization. We have no official backing from our school. To be able to be called the heart and soul of the team and to have the trust of players who are honestly better than me is incredibly humbling and I'm very, very thankful. And it would, it would, it would mean the world to win it. All righty, Crumbs. We're going to line up champs like for game one in just a moment, but what a final we have set here on the college championship stage. That's right. We got a varsity team versus a bunch of good guys from Canada that just love League of Legends and continue to make it to the top every single time. Just imagine what would happen if one of these Canadian universities would support one of these teams. A reminder that Canada is the only country to have won back-to-back -back college championships here in North America with UBC turning a trick in the first two years of the competition, I believe. But Maryville, no strangers to winning themselves, have also won the title two years ago in 2017 and looking to bring it back home. And from the video we just saw, this is going to get really spicy. The matchup that we think is going to matter the most is going to be in the top lane. But Gorica has been asking for lessons from Niles. So his senpai, he's up against him right now. And they both have a very shared champion pool. You've got the Kled, you've got Aatrox, you've got Akali. I think that so much is going to go down in the top lane matchup that the mind games are going to begin right from the draft. Yeah, two freshman top laners that have shown a ton of talent on this stage, not to mention throughout the tournament. But let's see where we end up, because as you mentioned, things will likely get spicy as we kick off the first draft of our best of five. Clyde will lose his Pike, and Niles will lose his Jace, and Nico getting out of there as well. Maryville don't want to play against that, or Julius is Hecarim. His Pike is out, but his Thresh has been awesome, and I wonder if University of Western Ontario is going to respect that, because it gave a lot of troubles to all the teams that Maryville have gone up against, and he does main it, but that's pretty much what it takes to be a support. If you're a support player and you don't play Thresh, are you really a support player? Well, we'll see if Weston do want to ban it here, because Blaze Nova did fall to that as well in their Game 5 yesterday that got them here, but it's just too good. Have to respect it, will take it away and set themselves up for a strong flex in pick one. Absolutely, look at that. He's already nodding. Man, again, Game 1 already getting targeted out, but that still frees up so much in the rest of the map. You've got Silas, you've got Akali, Rise, even Nautilus, if you want to go down the list of hook support. So there's still a lot to play with in tons of roles. And Akali going to be the champion band away here. So kind of one of those flexes losing out. Silas jumps to mind as maybe the more, most popular first pick in this kind of spot. But Rise also available, so lots of champions to consider here. And both solo laners are comfortable to play this all on both sides. So Rise will be the first pick here for Weston. They saw what Niles did yesterday on the Rise. He almost 1v4 and drew so much pressure to the bottom side of the map. But now he's going to get his hands on the Aatrox again. He has not been shy about taking this champion first right away. Almost always he goes to the top lane. But Maryville University did flex it yesterday. One game, the Aatrox went into the jungle. When they are in red side, consider that the flex is going to be used all the way until the last pick. And even though that game didn't work out for them, it's actually nice to see them just say, hey, we can play this here as well. So you don't just assume where it's going every time. So 
even in that loss, they kind of showed that, hey, we have versatility for this pick, even though we're willing to first pick it so often. They also will grab the Nautilus here, again, likely for Clyde, but there is some flexibility to see it mid lane, although we haven't seen it in quite a while. Julius, though, not messing around straight to comfort on Kindred and Braum there as well for Blaze Nova. It's a super aggressive jungler, a very good matchup into Rek'Sai. CKG wants to play that, and there's not a lot of junglers that you are going to be able to take that are going to do well into Rek'Sai, considering that Julius will have the opportunity to ban out any junglers that he doesn't want to play against. It's also really good against Nautilus because the whole point of Death Charge is that you eliminate the target the second that they're knocked up. Surprise, there's a Kindred ultimate. You can't take the target down just yet. We'll actually go here for Saskio's pick, and now they're going to ban away ADs from Short Hop. So a little bit of, uh, you know, anti-Kindred there for the Buster Shot, although not the most reliable. But Saskio, I think, again, just picking comfort and trying to target, you know, really the captain of this team on Western in Short Hop. But he'll lose his Jinx as well here in Phase 2. And then Siva straight into the bin on the Maryville side. And Velko's Yasuo, yeah, Weston saying, we know your champs too. So I think they don't want, or they do want, Ooh, he hasn't Short Top to play that Caitlyn. But the Velkos ban is because Wolfie played Velkos into Rise yesterday and did really well into it. He didn't find a solo kill, but instead, he's not going to take the Zerath, another one of his signature champions, going with a Zoe. Very similar to Zerath and Velkos in that you hit some poke and you can all in and one shot somebody from a mile away. I feel like Zoe's kind of the modern Zerath in some ways here. So, certainly a very powerful champion, and one he'll be happy to pilot. That will kick the picks back over to Weston here, who needs to finish off their draft. Short Hop being pushed down quite a number of picks. They will take Vladimir here to complete their solo lane needs. And not Janna, unless something very spicy is happening. Although, could? There is a possibility of Vlad bottom lane. Not that many mages here. Callista certainly a pick that Short Hop knows his way around. If I recall correctly, that was the champion that got him. Uh, literal 1v5 with the Nexus exposed back into a series. This is someone that has been through so much and with how they played yesterday in their five game set, you can see why, but to Kaelin for him, that was the pick he last played here on this stage. And it is the change up once again, Aurelia last pick for Niles, giving the Aatrox over to CKG. Utilizing that flex pick and this, Irelia is going to be so aggressive in the top side of the map. He has the Aatrox to back him up. And against the Vlad that is weak in the early levels, there's going to be a lot of trouble up there. I really like what we've seen out of Maryville here so far. The Zoe is a great answer when you're dealing with the likes of a Kindred, making sure that you can poke her out. And even the Tristana, you can bust or shot somebody out of their Lamb's Respite to make sure that you can take them down and really countering that Kindred ultimate when it truly counts. Certainly will pay close attention to the top and jungle on both sides here. Julius has been a huge player for his team, kind of pushing him over the line. It does feel like in a lot of ways, he's the kind of aggressive center of this team. He is always going in, maybe sometimes when he shouldn't, but he doesn't look at it that way. As a Kindred, that's the way you have to do it. You have to be very aggressive here. This is Gorica on your screen, going up against his former coach, Niles, Julius in the jungle. CKG, we're about to get it on. Yeah, and CKG on the other side, trying a much more controlled style, has been really good at tracking other junglers, teaming up and counter ganking a lot of the time. So I feel like if you just isolate the top and jungle matchups and see how they play, that's actually a pretty good read on how the teams generally have approached their games here in the college championship. So an interesting little tidbit when we looked at the stats between Gorica and Niles was that Niles had almost twice the jungle participation of his team. That means that Gorica is often left on an island, freeing up the bottom lane, freeing up the mid lane, but they get relatively equal results. So I want to see what Julius and CKG do towards the top side here and see if there's any variations from the stats we already have. Well, you heard it from the desk. It is indeed Championship Sunday here in the LCS Arena, and there can only be one 2019 college champion. Will Canada bring the trophy back over the border crumbs? Or is it Maryville's second time for the title? Let the best team decide. All right, well, nothing too kooky to kick things off. Going to be a very respectful tenant champ spread across the river. And you heard these teams, you know, they're friends. It's not just, you know, we, we are competitors that want to play and they're only like cutthroat players. You know, these are kids going through college, Minions hanging out with each other, playing league. That's the Helping best. each other with their education. That's the best part about it, right? You're playing against friends that help you practice, that you actually enjoy spending time with, the same as your team, and you have that extra level of respect, so you're going to be playing even better than you usually do just because 
you already are playing against people that have an expectation of yourself as a person and as a player. And apart from now, you know, when the conferences come together to compete, they're separate throughout the regular season. But that does not mean that you only play people within your conference. Scrims are a huge part of any cult practice culture in League of Legends. And I don't know for certain, but there is a non-zero chance these two teams have played each other quite a lot behind the stage. Most likely. And we're going to have both junglers doing similar routes, start in the red side and continuing to path down there. CKG doing Raptors to red, really standard, and then the Kindred going for most likely just a full red side clear. Now that the Scuttler spawns at 250, he's not going to be getting those marks early on. And this is business as usual in the top lane. Niles being hyper aggressive. Yep, gets the early proc for the passive. Happy to chase on. Get the damage down. Hits level two, stacking up the wave. Gonna get it pushing ASAP. Does not want that to freeze in front of the turret. Look at what Wolfie has already done. Scouting out Julius. This ward is gonna go a long ways because now they know that Julius is level two. So he's done red and doubles. And that he's gonna hit three here and continue to path to the top side of the map. So now this is a good timing of when he can play aggressive without fearing a kindred gang. And same with CKG. Somebody has snuck in a ward. It was Blaze Nova. And now both junglers have been completely spotted out. Yeah, nice mm -hmm. bit of vision there for Maryville. It's Wolfie lucky enough to pick a protobot up off the ground. And again, watching the bot side. It really has been a, a great tournament here from Blaze Top and Short. From Short Hop and Blaze Nova, excuse me. And I think Saskio and Clyde, for the most part, have kind of done their job. Saskio has been a great role player, and Clyde's been a pretty spectacular playmaker. But he loves to leave this lane. So if Short Hop and Blaze Nova have had so much success in their 2v2, I wonder if some of that style has to change, where you need to babysit your AD a little bit more and make sure Saskio doesn't fall too far behind. Looks like that's going to help, though. I think the picks in the bottom lane is what's going to determine how well Clyde and Sasuke are going to do because this Rastana has been really high priority. Let's fight into the top lane. That was real smooth there from Niles, bouncing over to a minion. Just for a bit of extra before continuing the trade. Gorakilo level 4. Niles has the wave stacked back towards him. He's now going to try and stick it here and see if he can't freeze against the Vlad. Yeah, he can't all in. That ward just spotted Kindred doing the first mark. Lucky for her, it spawned in the top side Scuttler, so... First stack for Julius, three away from hitting that extra range and damage. And we've said it every day, but it does bear repeating. We are playing on patch 9.10, so the Rift Scuttle uh, spawned much later, as you noted. Kind of a nerf to Kindred, honestly, at least as far as the early game pathing goes. It is. You don't get as lucky with those marks, but I'm pretty sure someone's done the math to offset that maybe the second camp or the second mark spawns a little bit sooner. Who knows? It's very difficult to track these things down unless you test them out yourself. Also does mean that Yumi is available. We've actually seen her in the tournament already from UCI. So a lot to watch for here is there's been a ton of unique champions played just in this top eight alone. And Wolfie not letting Slasher 1144 base here. Losing out some of those minions and we'll have to use that teleport to get back into the lane. And Niles trying to stack the wave here as well. CKG was coming up in case of potential jungle ganks, but I think Niles is out of mana, so he wants to go home and buy up. He actually has a, almost a 20 CS lead, but the wave stacking towards Gorica means that that lead is probably quite a lot less. We'll see just how much, much as he picks up the creep. Yeah, as Vlad, all you're trying to do is just farming as best as possible. Try not to die, and Niles is not having any of that because his first item has been the Executioner's Calling, diminishing some of that healing out of the Vlad, hoping to get some all lanes, hoping to get some harass that will stick to prep him for a dive. Refills the potion, grabs a biscuit, and has the longsword to boot. So certainly looking to really heavily pressure the Vlad. As we did see Julius pop down to the bottom lane, but nice ward in the tri-bush there does spot it for Maryville. Still very tense as we're five and a half minutes through and first blood is available for the taking. It's hard to judge what the scaling is going to do in these games because there's just so much damage and explosiveness out of both the teams. There's skill shots that you just can't account for. If Zoe hits a crazy bubble, it doesn't matter what stage in the game you're in, you're going to get eliminated. If Vlad has an amazing flank, he's going to wipe your team. So these elements means that scaling is not really such a concern. It's all about getting the right fight and getting the position first. And from what we've seen in Collegiate so far, getting the jump on. Nile, he did it again. Well, he was gonna He's going to start the Kindred. Julius, no, we'll get the counter kill. 
That's that Executioner's Calling. That's doing the damage that Vlad just cannot mitigate. The whole point of Vlad and his strength in lane is healing. By providing that healing reduction, he just cannot stay in here. So I think he dings six off that cannon and goes for the all-in. Yep. And got the pop. He may play down, but he's like, yeah, still chase you. So he must have gotten the pool first, which was the reason that he got to do the all-in. There's no way that Vlad had pool and did not use it. So really well done by Niles there. Thankfully, the Hemo Plague by Garka does mean that Julia, Julius's cleanup is very straightforward, but that pressure top play created by Niles on his own does leave the Drake open for Maryville, who will take the first ocean. And yeah, not bad at all. Now, Niles, not Julius rather, not feeling comfortable enough to go for a red buff counter jungle here, even though it is known that it's about to spawn, knowing that the jungler started on the red side and is already seven minutes in. So it would be about 10 seconds for the buff to spawn. Niles continuing to build up waves and harass the Vlad up 12 CS, but that's a huge wave of about the same amount of minions coming in. Thoraka will lose one to the turret there, but we'll see how he gets the rest of them as kind of just trying to stave off the pressure that Niles is mounting in the top lane. And that's how the lane is going to continue to play out. You're going to have Niles pushing in and trying to get something else on the map. Now, the longer this goes, the harder it's going to be to dive that Vladimir because he's going to get more HP, more levels, and he's going to be able to thin out the wave much faster as he starts stacking that ability power. So Niles, he's going to have to try to get his lead and spill it over to other parts of the map or have somebody else come in to help him tower dive Vladimir. Well, on the other side here for Weston, good news in the bot lane. Short hop gets some plates alongside Blaze Nova. and does have about a wave ahead in CS at this stage of the game. You can see kind of the advantages building from the strong points that have been showcased throughout the tournament for both of these sides. And then mid lane's going even, because that's how Rise Zoe works. Yeah, the Rise versus Zoe matchup has been one that Wolfie has been favoring for quite some time. He pretty much has been winning every single time he's up against any Rise in any matchup. So I think he's very familiar with this pick. And look at that. That's exactly the opportunity that Niles wants. The wave is pushing back. He gets the pool out of Gorica, and now he can't walk up. There's a jungler here being oh, very pesky. He's going to get hit by that. Does get the knockup as well. Kindred is behind, but needs to be a little bit closer. Well done to Pump. That's going to be a kill for CKG. Niles running through the turret to try and threaten Julius and escort his jungler out safely. It's a power of the 2v2, but Clyde and Saskia are going for his oh, face. Short hop, rocket drop on the face. They get the buster shot down as well. They're going to snare up the Braum. Short hop low, but does not fall all in. Not working out there for Maryville. Interesting use of the buster shot. They're not sure why they wanted to get the Caitlyn out of there, but they still get both summoners. And in the top side of the map, I think that's a more relevant play. They were able to take down the Vladimir. Aatrox had a kill. And look at that minion wave. It's pushing back. Vladimir is in some deep trouble. Caitlyn is not the biggest priority here. She's going to be able to always farm, whereas Vladimir, not so much. He is very easy to kill at this stage. Thankfully for Gorica, wave's going to bounce here. As it did crash towards the turret, but Niall still picks up all the CS. And holding a pretty healthy lead in the current 1v1. Also of note, both top laners have very stubbornly hold on to their teleports here. Nobody wants to concede and TP into the lane and have somebody TP elsewhere and get an even bigger advantage. So That's what the problem is. If you use your teleport to the lane, then your opponent can use the teleport bot side. A little bit of dancing, some flashiness out of Niles onto Gorik and knowing that he has full control in this lane and that Gorik is just dancing to Niles' feet here. Again, gonna push the wave in. Gorik is gonna fake the recall. Just by really just waiting more than anything else, but this will be a plate over to the Aurelia. Niles continuing to build up pretty nice gold lead. Has 1,700 banked right now. Is up about 1,000 gold as far as individual 1v1 goes. And the Vision has spotted Western going for a Rift Herald move, swapping out their bottom lane. It looks like they're trying to get a lane swap going. They don't want to have Vladimir versus Aurelia anymore, maybe? Or instead, they just want to get this Herald, try to get some gold. Ooh, they land the, the bubble. Rise. That's going to force a flash, but his Nile's actually going to TP in. Look for the sun, finds it on the slasher, and he's going to clean house on that kill. Rift Herald over to Weston. But what else can they get done here? Clyde finds the hook. Julius flashes into it. And now Clyde gonna lock it up. Gorica can't do anything, so he just has to watch his teammate die. A good pull to dodge the next bubble, but Rift Herald traded for two kills. That's two kills. That is not worth it for Western. They need to be using that Rift Herald to try to get a tower first brick or anything to make just to just break even out of that trade. Because the fact that that ward spotted 
Western going for that play gave Maryville University enough time to think about what they needed to do to respond and answer appropriately. Here the bubble connects onto Rise, but he just did not expect that Niles was going to teleport behind him. He thought he was safe. And Niles cleans up, was coming to the fight anyway, and now Clyde nails this hook on the Julius. It's a tough position to be in because Nautilus has ultimate still. It doesn't matter if that hook was going to hit. You're going to get hit by ult, and when you're Kindred, you either die or you use ultimate and stall your death. So at least he doesn't burn the ult and recognizes that he's doing it. That's Punisher from Slasher. Wolfie tries to use that flash he picked up to get some sort of trade on, but now forced to use the barrier he found as well. As Slasher just stands his ground. And zaps down the Zoe, CKG there on that side of the map as Miles continues to apply pressure in the top lane. There's also a Drake up that Maryville didn't go for after those two kills. And now it's actually Weston that are here in the area. That's a mark for Kindred, Wolfie, and Slash is still trading out. Mid lane is pretty low on health here, and I think that is going to cause Weston to back off. Yeah, they just can't go for it considering that bot lane was pushed out by the Tristana. That's one of the powers of Triss. That's why Saskio has been loving this champion. You can constantly push the wave. The second that somebody ignores you, you have priority and you can murder turrets when you are left untouched. So I'm loving that Saskio continues to pick this and it frees up Clyde to help CKG to get vision to make sure that they can defend objectives if they're not first to move. I think Niles probably should have ordered that turret for what it's worth. Just collected a little bit of plate gold, but doesn't mind anything. Just wanted to get back ASAP. He was roaming down in case the Drake was going to be started, and Gorica with his TP still available, did not use it on a play just yet, would have been able to get there nice and easily. Instead, Maryville realized that the space has been cleared out, and that is a very fancy dragon take. It is. It's not spotted by the Scuttle Vision, which is really nice, nice trick. It only really catches you if you're practically touching that border, so there are ways to outplay it, and it just takes the practice and experience for you to know how you can pull that off. And if you kept building up this top lane matchup, big inflection point here for Niles. Oh, John gets CC'd. Julius, little brash perhaps channeling that, but I don't think Wolfie had his bubble. Yeah, he went for it because he knew that Sleepy Trouble bubble was just used, but still, taking so much damage means that you're not getting any towers out of this. Realm Warp comes in, they're gonna fight. Here's Niles with the Triforce. Realm Warp gets out too, though. Gonna leave Weston safe. That was very close. That was a, that was a scary one. You're clinching, knowing that the Rise Ultimate had to come through before Nautilus, or else they were both gonna get killed. Well, as we return to some more normalcy, as people return to their lane, Saskio pushing down, looking for his first item. Short hop doing the same, although he does have the Zerkas already done. Wolfie, the skill shot accuracy. That's what he loves. He loves playing that Velkos, the Zerath, the Sindras, the Zoe's, and all those skill shots are transferable from champion to champion, which makes him a threat in the mid lane. Quite the menace, if you think about it, that he's always going to have that accuracy. And look at Saskia in the bottom lane, just pushing so hard. Caitlyn just can't keep up at this stage in the game. Well, plates went even. Thanks once you to the Herald there for Weston, but gold isn't really. It's 2k up for Maryville as they continue to look to dive this Vladimir on a control ward. Aurelia has Executioner's calling and Triforce already done. It's a play on bot side instead here for Weston. They've done it so many times. Clyde, after Dark Prox, but he's just not tanky enough and he does go down. That was a hero play out of Blaze Nova, positioning himself in front of Short Hop in order to absorb the bus stuff so that like Caitlyn was not going to get hit. That was really smart by him, but Saskio is now left alone and he just has to base. You can't stand up to Caitlyn and Brom. They will tower dive you, chaining that stun into the traps, into the ace in the hole. And again, the leader of this team, the captain in so many ways, goes for Vision, doesn't quite connect, but still the passive was on and that was enough. Look at that, blocking the buster shot, really, really nice. And the Fissure also actually connected onto Saskia, preventing him from walking away sooner out of that brush. So just a really nice play and an understanding of the limits of Caitlyn and Brom. This is why Short Hop loves to go back on Caitlyn. It's his most played. And I, I cannot understand the impact that Short Hop has on this team. Again, a school that, a team that does not unfortunately for them have backing from their school. He is the backing for the school. Well, that's, when the, that's gonna give you the underdog mentality even further when you know that even the school is not interested. You are your own boss here, and now we've got an engage on two. On some place? Yeah, Niles is like, I shouldn't be here. Flash is out of there. 
Good punish there from Weston. Yeah, Ryze is not Vladimir. He will lock you down and deal damage. Saskia, though, looking to break open some turrets. Maryville already took the top outer. Thanks to Niles. Saskia are going to finish off the bottom outer here as well. And also managed to grab mid thanks to the pressure. Clyde all missing that hook. The boss cone auto betrays him. Blaze Nova getting low, but here's the depth shot. going to counter engage onto Short Hop. Saskia going to try and stand his ground as Wolfie does get the tick down in onto Blaze Nova. Short Hop also low, needs to be careful. There's just so much damage coming from a distance that Western has a very hard time engaging on. Kindred is not the champion that wants to be engaging. She wants to be counter engaging, but a dive onto Gorica. Yeah, no pull. Vanguard's out. Took it for the stun, but good flash out there from Gorica. Emo Plague also down, so Niles maybe can look again, but Slasher. Niles is going to see him. Niles to dance his way out of here. Niles has no flash. He Whoopi, just pushed the wave. He's going to try to tank it for Niles, it seems. No ace in the hole. Is anybody else nearby? DKG is here as well. Clyde also coming in. Niles, I think, has enough backup to get out of here. There's the blast plant. Puts the stun down, and he'll be out. Very nice. Drawing a lot of pressure. And meanwhile, Tristana in the bottom lane was able to take down that tier two. So while they're chasing him, they're still keeping their eyes on the prize, getting those objectives. What it looked like to be just one mishap ends up being a next level tier two take in under 20 minutes. And we've seen this so often for Maryville throughout the tournament. Niles starts by creating pressure either on his own or with CKG. And then one other side lane starts to feel the pressure. This time it's Saskia. Usually it's Wolfie playing some sort of 1-3-1 bit. It all stems from the pressure that he starts that it cascades down into a team that's proven to be very controlled and very well disciplined throughout the tournament. And he's got to be thrilled because in a situation like that, you always want your team to be trying to do something assertive when they're wasting resources on you. And it's really frustrating when that doesn't happen, when your team does not convert anything while you're drawing all this attention. And because we see this time and time again that they do convert the pressure that he applies into an objective he's going to continue to be aggressive and try to get more of that because the team's backing him up and that's one of the great signs of a team that is a well-oiled machine utilizing pressure from one side to get objectives in the other and speaking of his cloud right now the third overall for maryville it's just continuing to stack objectives and build up gold up to about three thousand now it's never Explosive, which are games we've seen a lot of from Weston throughout this tournament, and in a good way, mind you. Sleepy Kindred! Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Stomp down. That's the danger of taking that Kindred early when you have not seen a full commitment to a composition. Maryville rotated into a poke mid laner, which is a fantastic answer to Kindred, and she just has no way of dealing with Kindred. It's gonna happen every single time you get hit by Sleepy Trouble. Level. Even the Paddle Star is gonna take you out. Let's see how it happens. Completely blind! Okay, that's just unlucky. That's just, yeah, what can you say? That's unlucky. I mean, Wolfie knows that he can just freely throw things through Torrent. He, he get walked, hit. Julius walked through a control ward and then got hit by that. His own control ward, mind you. Just so he thinks. As Wolfie continuing to push down. Again, does not miss often with the skill shots. He and Clyde, I think, are almost having a competition so you can land more skill shots over the course of the tournament. Maryville still trying to find a way in for a siege here. Blue buff steals, always nice when you're looking to siege and poke things out with a Zoe. And again, look back down to Niles. Look here to Saskio. It's almost tri lane pressure right now for Maryville without Baron even having spawn, and Julius cannot be standing there. Knock up lands, he pops the lands for a spite. DKG wants to finish up the kill, the Death Touch is gonna get it done! Rooted in place, Kai gets the kill, gonna make it two, and the Blaze Nova, no! Does stand behind Shorto and burn the Flash to get away. They take down Julius, but are there pings onto the Baron? There are, they're gonna be rushing this objective. There is a Mountain Drake, and only Aatrox and Nautilus have used their ultimate. You still have... Aurelia to engage, Zoe to zone off, and even Tristana to get anybody that's trying to contest out of that pit. I think it's going to go over to Maryville. And they're being so methodical and calculated here. One pick, turn to the Baron, decisive, and going for the maximum value. And again, a team that has just shown so much consistency throughout their tournament, particularly after pushing through their quarterfinal. At that point, th these are, those are kind of the sloppiest games you've seen from them at this point. Let's take another look at how this one all started. So they see Julius and he gets tagged by Aatrox. 
almost one shot right away. And the second that he uses that lamp to spike, Clyde is there to lock him down. There's no jumping over a wall. There's no shenanigans here. And while Blaze Nova does escape, it doesn't matter. You eliminate the smite. And because you have a Mountain Drake, you have control of the blue side. You can always start it knowing that there is no chance of a Baron Steel. And if the side lane Aurelia now with the Triss on the top as well, 1-3-1, one, one, wasn't good enough before when they were ahead. Real good when you have Baron. <laughs> And it's only going to get worse for Vladimir because Irelia is building a wit's end. With the healing reduction and even more healing, Gorica just can't afford to have some sort of Morello Nomicon. He needs to be dealing as much damage as possible, thinking about the team fight. So now it's going to be left unanswered. Julius and Gorica are going to try to go on him, but is he strong enough to 1v2? Another Niles oh. 1v2. Maybe not this time. Does get shut down. And that's a good pick, really good pick for Weston. That is, he gets a stack, stops the Baron, and now if they can base in time, they won't lose an inhibitor here. Tristana is very fast at pushing, though, already half HP on that tower. Yeah, again, Maryville's so good at making sure they have pressure on the other side when Niles is in the side lane, drawing more members down there. That turret lives on a few bits of health. But Wolf are gonna finish off the tier two mid, just to make sure the Baron power play keeps on rolling. So now they're going to have to stop pushing here, unfortunately. Even though Tristana is great at sieging, they're down a member. Unless Niles plans on teleporting, they're not very keen on taking a 5v4. That's good. It's going to blow it up. Takes the turret. guess they just they value the, the minute and a half left they well, have I think on this Baron. Look at Julius. Julius is on the bottom side of the map. He's not there to try to look for a defense. He's there doing Krugs. Maybe trying to find a flank now, but... Tough. I mean, you don't really want to kill this Aatrox. And Wolfie's really hard to pin down. He's throwing skill shots from a screen and a half away. I think they're also just going to sweep it out and find him. And Saskio trying to threaten here. Slasher doing a nice job clearing out the waves. But with a minute left here on Baron Niles, despite not having the buff, is trying to get the pressure in so Maryville can finish the push they started. And he's back. No Baron. But now University of Western Ontario they're back to 5v5 here, and that's not where you want to be. You're down about 7,000 gold, so you always want to try to get a numbers advantage. Maybe going on Niles once again between Vladimir and Julius, but in every other part of the map, there's just not a lot of chance here. Look at Tristan. She's well protected with the minion waves. Rice just can't defend against her. Yeah, I mean, just can't kill the Baron upgrades fast enough. Fight's there. If he tries to go aggressive, so they do get the in here, but they'll take down the top. I'll grab the red buff on the way out, and Mary will say, okay, that's enough. Let's go spend our gold and push once again for this Drake and even further into the lead. Yeah, they're really strong right now, but Caitlyn would be the way back for University of Western Ontario here. Short hop, utilizing that range. He's going to need one more item to really start denting Maryville University here. You need that rapid fire cannon. That makes a world of difference when you're dealing with targets that are trying to dive you or really long range pokers like a Tristana or a Zoe. The answer is always, almost always short hop when it comes to Western. Never count this team out. They've already played five games against last year's champions and were able to take them down. So. Well, in that game four, they were down two inhibitors and still found a way back into this game. So we don't want to count them out until we see the Nexus really go down because they are resilient. Yeah, two inhibitors is nothing for short hop. I think he has three for breakfast every morning. I think he had three before he came here. And now the execution is calling. Still building again, as you mentioned, does need three items. Maryville uh, with a continually strong lead, and those top supers is going to make contesting this next Baron a big problem. It is. When you have the poke that Wolfie's providing right now, 3-0-2 on Zoe, about to have that death cap, and not a single big item of magic with this besides the no magic mantle onto the rise. It means that anybody that can tag is one shot, literally. Julius drags back into the chain. CKG lands up the combo perfectly. Doesn't force the ulti though, but Niles roams over. Julius continuing to get chunked here as Maryville just sieging until the Baron comes back up. That's pretty much all this is. It is. You continue to put the pressure here, wait until the wars in the blue side have faded out. You didn't even have to bother clearing them. But because there's nobody to actually answer them anyway. Oh! Chris steps on the trap. That's good though. Brom asleep from the bubble. Happy to do some damage there. Now it's gonna bounce back down to the bottom wave. And again, the supers are coming into the top lane. 
So that's a neat little trick that Slasher did there. When you're trying to defend the base and you don't want to split up and you need to all be grouped up, you can always draw the minions from one lane to the lane that you're trying to defend to make sure that the tower is helping you out. And then you can just start clearing waves and collapse sooner than you need oh, to. Oh, steps on a bubble. Slasher gonna have to tank it. Steps uh, does, does get used. But again, Sasuke maybe a little too low. Wolfie now on the front side gonna be forced to use his real flash. There's just nobody to proc the Brom passive between Kindred and Caitlyn. If Kindred goes in, she's gonna get taken out. Caitlyn has to stay in the back, and Ryze and Vladimir are not preoccupied with using auto attack, so there's not a lot of crowd control on the side of University of Western Ontario to actually lock down anybody, even a target like Zoe. And as you say, Crumbs, you stay out on the map, you know they can't have any vision. You've timed out all the wards they could have potentially gotten in there. So they walk straight back to Baron. They had two oceans to heal up from the poke, and that mountain's gonna help them take down yet another objective. And I want to see what they do against this Tristana because she was the biggest threat to these towers. Mid lane is about to drop one auto attack, and they will secure that one with a rapid fire cannon easily. But University of Western, you've got a rise ultimate. You can make a party start. Okay, you can start the party. The party Use portal. The realm warp. You teleport behind them. Go out with a bang. One in him down, 7,000 gold behind. Certainly still away here, but this will be a tough Baron to try and get through as Maryville looking to put the finishing touches on this game with the buff. This should definitely be the final push for Maryville if they execute right. They don't need three inhibitors. Tristana is very strong. The other Canadians defend on the PK then. Baron is real good, even when everyone's alive. That line of five traps is really what's slowing down Maryville. Tristana does not want to step up. Not a single member wants to get hit by one of those big fat crits because it'll make the dive a lot weaker. There was no, there was no stun. That's one spell. I mean, he's got the death cap finish now. Wolfie is extremely powerful in the Zoe. And as you mentioned, there's really not much MR to speak of. Power goes down. They've broken the midsection now. Top and hips coming back up in 20 seconds. Maryville still need a little bit more here. DKG over the wall, being kind of cute. Vlad and Kindred are trying to go on the rally, but she's not having any of that. And Miles again dancing around. Julius looking for it, but the Vanguard's edge gonna pop on. That's gonna force out the lamps of spine. Here comes Clyde to finish it all off. So depth charge for Vlad. There's the first kill. It's actually Clyde that gets Julius, and now the rest of the squad rotating down to help out their top laner. Already. A 4v5 now for Weston. Hook's gonna land in. Niles low, but Sasuke able to get down. Slasher CKT diving in with the World Ender on. Resurrects over the Torres. Whoopi with a massive poke. Takes down Short Hop in one fell swoop. And that's gonna be game one. Maryville clean up the base. Such a clean game one out of Maryville University. They knew exactly what they needed to do, what their win condition was gonna be, and how they had to execute. I didn't think they panicked for a single second here. This was so clean. And that's this team, calm, collected, patient, and precise. As Maryville take a lead here in the College Championship Grand Final. They came out swinging. They had a plan, flexing the Aatrox, knowing that Western was gonna think that it was gonna go to the top lane, threw out the jungle, flexed again, and then gave the Aurelia matchup into the Vladimir, because if Vlad was blinded, they were thinking, oh, it's gonna be Vlad against Aatrox. We can, might be able to handle that. It's okay, it's not the best, not the worst, but when the Aurelia comes through, now it's a hard one. And it's like any exam, you have to trust in your preparation. They did it yesterday, and that's the only game they lost in that semifinal, so, Credit to the team for saying, no, no, we practiced this. We just mis-executed in that last game. We're happy to do it again. We're confident in our picks. and They don't shy away from it, and it, it does really well with that red side counter pick. And I wonder, are you really getting a lot out of Bannon Clyde's Pike and Thrash? Because his Nautilus, about three games in a row, has just been stellar every single time. It's a really strong pick right now, so it's not like you're dropping his champion pool in priority. He's still getting S-tier champions. And he says himself, he's got a deep champion pool. We've seen really only his Rakan that's maybe been not as good given the level yeah. he has shown on the hook champions. But even if he eats a bunch of bands, I'm sure there's more to play. And do you really want to ban out a support and open the floodgates up in top lane? Not anymore, <laughs> not anymore. The floodgates are open in the top lane. Yeah, I mean, I think less than themselves also have plenty of picks. Short up had a good laning phase. You can always rely on him to get things going. This time with the Caitlyn not able to get over the line. Maybe even giving Slasher something a bit yeah. more aggressive, something where he can actually tussle 
and either try and kill Wolfie and get pressure, or just leave the lane and go affect somewhere else. Because both these mid laners are really good at playing the control mages, but I think they're better when they can help their team. Yeah, I'm glad you brought up Wolfie. He he had a great series here. I, he did not die. He just was able to find so many picks. He won his lane. And when you have a Zoe that wins lane that can translate to finding picks across the map, you have your the best mid laner you could ever want. Yep, game feels pretty straightforward. For more on how game one played out, though, let's hand it over to the State Farm Analyst Desk. Thank you so much, Pastry Time. We are back at the analyst desk, this time joined by UCI's jungler. I'm Avi. Avi, welcome to the desk. Hello, thanks for having me. Of course, happy to have you anytime, any day. Because <laughs> we have the Collegiate Championship to talk about. The game number one has completed, and my, oh my, we talked about the way top lane was going to go, but I want to, right off the bat, Connor, how did they end up setting up that top lane so we could see that explicit matchup between Western and Maryville? Well, Western tried the rise early flex pick, which makes some sense, but I think that they just forgot about Irelia. It just seemed like an oversight to me, especially where they, they sort of have these two free bands in the second phase where they could have targeted the Irelia. They end up taking the Vladimir on four, and Vladimir and rise are double flexible, meaning you can play them in either lane, but the problem is Irelia is winning both of those matchups. So if they take the Irelia off the table, maybe this makes some sense, but the fact that you have one pick that's in Niall's comfort pool that's winning against both your solo lanes makes it just really hard for Gorica to play. And Gorica facing into Niles, Maryville putting in the work in game number one, Mark. Yeah, I think that was what we had our eyes on at the start of this. And right away, Niles says, no, it's about me. Don't worry about Gorica. I'm going to take over this game. And uh, he found the solo kill to kick off. And that's exactly what Maryville kind of wants to have their kind of opening note be in this entire series, having your star player pop off by himself. Avi, I know you have to spend a lot of time rotating to the top lane once in a while. What did you think of things how it played out? Yeah, so I spend my time mostly bot lane, but I have to watch my top laner endure sometimes. So uh, definitely when we studied both of these teams, I think we knew their top laners were part of their strengths. Uh, Niles obviously called his jungler a lot, Cat God. I think that Cat God is one of those junglers that's willing to uh, like sacrifice a lot of his camps to just help his top laner out and I think that's what makes him such a great jungler in this tournament Like he's willing to give away camp leads give away anything that he needs to get get his laners ahead And you had mentioned when we were kind of chatting some of that interesting style that CK, CKG has in comparison to Julius Yeah, so I think Julius is one of those kind of standard junglers where he wants to get ahead uh, for himself. He wants to get his jungle lead and then transfer it into objectives or even like, yeah, just like towers, objectives, and later on kills. Uh, Cat God is a bit different. He plays for his laners. I think that it's actually a really like good play style right now. Soul laners are probably the strongest lanes in the game right now. So uh, putting, your, putting your resources into their hands is probably the best way to play jungle right now. And seeing Cat God kind of willing to do that is it's pretty inspiring, and I think he's playing really, really well. And I really like Julius's play style from the previous series. I thought it was uh, very good against you guys, where he could play kind of the Kindred, which has some early game presence, but then is still a good team fighter because that seems to be what Western wants to focus on is their team fight comps when they have the Sivir and the Ori and all these different things working together. But you, that's exactly what Maryville's trying to play against, where they're splitting you up with all across the map with this popping off Aurelia and I think they need to find a way to go a little bit more stable in the early game if they have any hope of making that play style work out. And while Avi did just say how the top lane is super important in this matchup, the bottom lane seemed to be a very important aspect as well. Yeah, and this is something we talked about last night where Saskio, despite being a competitive player with a storied history, he's not a pure AD carry player. And here it just sort of exemplifies that, where he's using his rocket jump moving forward at a really bad time where Braum is coming down river and Shorthop ends up trading back this kill and overall, this could be a big match mismatch in this series. And Shorthop has these three picks he's really fantastic on. I would like to see them maybe prioritize the Sivir a bit higher, especially where Clyde is playing all of these hook champions. Sivir's a fantastic pick into all these champions. More safe, he can push, he can free up the support to roam. So maybe more Sivir priority in the rest set. Well, you just mentioned the hooks that were coming out of Clyde yesterday, but we also even saw Blaze Nova pulling off some of those same similar plays. So, Mark, do you think that that, if it comes off of the band table, could be one of those picks that could make the big difference for one of these teams? Uh, I actually kind of like them on Braum if they're going to go for team fighting, especially if they need to find some stability somewhere in their team comp because Jungle's, you know, like we said, is much more farm oriented, wants to play more carry style. So someone needs to step up. And I don't think you're going to be able to do that against Niles. You're going to need scrappier champions. And so I think 
unfortunately for Blaze Nova, he'll probably be on the tankier initiator. If he can get Nautilus, I think that's the best option because it's a combination of that tankiness and the engage uh, of a hook champion. But I think he's sadly going to have to be playing more utility this series. Braum duty. Braum duty. He's Braum stuck duty. on it. I think that also one thing I'd like to know about uh, Westoon's bot lane is Shorthop is basically their carry. Like if you saw their last series against uh, Harrisburg, Shorthop basically like 1v5, like by his Nexus, like playing Sivir. I think if you put Shorthop on one of his comfort picks, Jinx, Sivir, Caitlyn, like Caitlyn looked a little bit rough. Uh, I think that if you're forcing your Caitlyn out of lane to go for a Herald, it's not ideal. So, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the 10 minute Caitlyn roam is not really in the yeah, playbook that's, very often. Yeah. It's definitely not the play. So, hopefully, we see him on something like Sivir or Jinx where he can kind of pop off in those late game team fights. And I think you had a really interesting point about how when you played against them yesterday, you know, Youngbin is kind of like lane kingdoming everyone in yeah. scrims and in the tournament. And then he still, still was able to build leads, but couldn't find the dives that you guys were used to finding. And I think that speaks to how well you can expect short hop to play. And hopefully, like you're saying, with maybe raising Sivir priority and giving yeah. him more tools early on. But that was just game number one. We have a whole series ahead at the college championship. So Maryville walk away with game number one. Let's see how Western reply after the break. Don't go anywhere. You guys got this, love y'all. Let's go, fighting! Fighting, touches, touches, let's go, baby. Here we go. Go, boys. Hook's gonna land in Miles Boy, but Sasuke able to get down. Slash a CKT diving in with the World Ender on Resurrects under the Taurus. Whoopi with a massive poke takes down Short Hop in one fell swoop, and that's gonna be game one. Maribel clean up the base. 